I'm Brent Hoveman, co-founder and chairman of Founders Forum. For those of you who may not know us, Founders Forum is a global community of the top tech founders, corporate CEOs and senior investors. While our community is not able to gather, we are delighted to bring you here together for our event series of FF Live. Um, FF Live brings our community together virtually to discuss timely themes and trends with hand-picked international speakers and attendees. So we're delighted to have the Secretary of State um, for Department for Culture, Media and Digital Culture, Media and Sport. Um, so he's our minister for those of you tech entrepreneurs listening. Um, and so, Minister Oliver Dowden, thank you. Thank you, Brett. And it's, uh, friends, it's a pleasure to, to, to be here to speak to everyone. Um, I have a few opening uh, remarks. Uh, rather, uh, uh, when we, we do these things in person, I normally sort of stand up and make a speech. So I will just try to say a few opening remarks and then we can uh, open up to, to questions. The first thing I want to say is, look, I really wanted to do this brief. I've been, uh, I've discovered Secretary of State for just over 100 days. I was appointed uh, at the beginning of February. And I wanted to take on this role because I know the central role that uh, tech plays to our national life and our economy and how it's growing all the time. And indeed, we have seen that grow enormously uh, during this COVID crisis. Just to take a few um, statistics I'm sure you're familiar with, we take daily Zoom use that's gone from 10 million in December through to 300 million uh, in March. Our peak hour for internet use is now nine hours from noon till 9 p.m. And if you take public services, uh, we're out of the 1% of uh, the 340 million annual uh, visits to NHS GPs were by video before the crisis. That's 1% of 340 million. Now it's around 93%. And you just have to look at how it's transforming working practices as well. I'm sure you've all seen how uh, Mark Zuckerberg is planning for half of all Facebook staff to work from home forever. So it's just it's both an exciting brief normally and one that is absolutely central to our, our national debate and we've seen that for example with uh, the NHS X's track and trace uh, policies the fact that we have cabinet now by uh, by zoom and uh, many other areas of our national life are being uh, revolutionized and this isn't really un uncommon uh, we see this is a common theme in pandemic so you're going right back, and I'm not drawing direct comparisons, but the you know, Black Death effectively put nail in the coffin, the final nail in the coffin of feudalism through to the, the Spanish flu, which revolutionized public health and epidemiology. So uh, it is normal to see these sort of uh, huge transformations. Uh, I'm also conscious that, uh, and I was discussing this with Brent uh, in a previous conversation, you've had an awful lot of secretaries of state for digital culture, media and sport recently. So I'm very keen that uh, I, one of my first tasks is just to endure for a bit and give you some stability as, uh, as your Secretary of State. And uh, I wanted to do this not just because of the, um, the, the central role of tech in the way that I described, but also because I was previously responsible for the government digital service. So I also saw the role that tech can play in uh, transforming the delivery of government services as well. And both tech and the creative industries, which I'm talking about uh, today, are huge UK success stories. Before the, the um, crisis hit, they were the two fastest growing sectors uh, of the economy and feeding off of each other to the benefit of both. And uh, I have a passion for creative industries. I have the um, uh, Elstree Film Studios, BBC Elstree and soon to be Sky Elstree in my constituency. Uh, so I, I, I see that every day, but I also have a real passion for tech and I want I'm to be unashamedly pro-tech as Secretary of, of State. And I said that from the beginning, and I think particularly in areas uh, such as data or how we take a holistic view of uh, the regulation of, of tech. I'm keen to make sure that in me you have a, a champion uh, for the interests of the sector, which in turn uh, reflects the interests of, of society as a whole. And as I said, we start from a very strong position. Uh, we're behind only the US and China in terms of investment and the number of uh, tech unicorns. And also through this crisis, we are seeing uh, rapidly growing new sectors. So for example, the, the safety tech sector uh, has investment increasing more than eightfold in 2019. And I'm sure that that will increase uh, more rapidly still. So I'm keen both to maintain our global strength, but also 
to help drive the revival of sectors uh, post-COVID. And that's what I've been asked to talk about uh, today, the link between tech and the, the creative sector. Um, so if you take the creative sector, with film and TV alone, they're worth more than the uh, car industry in the UK. This obviously was before the, the, the crisis hit. And if you look at where the two fuse, for example, the makers of Call of Duty say that a staggering 407 million people have played its games online each month uh, this year. And really, I, I wanted to use today to sort of set a, a challenge and to, to have a discussion around how we can use this opportunity, how we can um, fuse the power of tech and uh, creative industries. And we are doing our bit as, as a government. Uh, we've put unprecedented uh, economic support in uh, to match the, the, the public health crisis. We've had a public health crisis leading to an economic crisis and we are, we're taking measures to, to try and put that support in place, whether that's the coronavirus job retention scheme, the self-employed income support scheme, tax deferrals, and of course the new £1.25 billion pound fund for UK's most uh, innovative companies, which uh, many of you on this call were involved in uh, developing uh, with the Chancellor and with me. So we're focused initially on support for the sectors to see them through this crisis, essentially to, to maintain that supply side capacity as it were. We're now moving through that and into the next challenge, which is how we safely open up uh, sectors. But then we also need to think to ourselves how, how we help sectors adapt to this, this new normal of social distancing and so on, which for the time being is going to have a tremendous impact, particularly on the, the creative industries. But alongside that, we're also putting in the the infrastructure to support tech and creative industries. So the first thing that the Prime Minister said to me when he appointed me was, I want you to deliver on our infrastructure commitments. So particularly the five billion pounds that we are putting into gigabit uh, broadband and uh, the, the, the rollout of that by 2025, giving us that ultra fast uh, broadband. Also, uh, the rollout of, of 5G, which both of those are going to be essential for ensuring that uh, what we're doing now uh, was science fiction 20 odd years ago. But it's thanks to the investment and the infrastructure that we've put in place in this country and around the world that we're able to, to do this and operate during a crisis. The, um, the investment in gigabit broadband 5G and so on will be about ensuring that we have that infrastructure for the technologies of tomorrow that will become com a commonplace in, in 20 years time. And allied to that is research and development. So uh, we put research and development at the heart of the creative industries uh, sector deal. And in the wake of coronavirus, um, I've been working with UKRI's Arts and Humanities Research Council to launch Found This Creativity. And this is a, a major campaign aimed at finding uh, pioneering ways for culture and digital technology to thrive during the COVID crisis. So just to take one example of uh, the sort of thing that, that's happening, as part of Boundless Creativity, there's a project called Dinosaurs and Robots, which will allow people to explore museums via augmented reality technology over the summer while they remain closed due to pandemic. And that's exactly what we want to see more of over the coming months and years. And in conclusion, wouldn't it be great uh, to see British technological solutions, the obstacles that the arts and creative industries are facing across the world as we speak. You know, for example, to create the killer app that finds socially distance friendly ways to put bombs on seats in our theatres or uses immersive uh, VR to transport music lovers from their lounges to live stream gigs. And it's not just because it's a philanthropic thing to do at this uh, time, although of course we've seen countless acts of, of kindness, but uh, the way people consume art, culture and other creative content has changed and continues to change. And there's a real gap here for tech to jump in and find new and unusual ways to deliver it. And an opportunity for real entrepreneurship. But I think there's also an opportunity to fuse together those two huge British strengths. Uh, we used to uh, talk about Britain being the, manu the workshop of the world, manufacturing um, so many things you used to see stamped with made in, in England. Um, now, our principal sort of industry that we're associated with in many ways are our creative industries and indeed our tech sector. People 
from around the world look to British creative industry, people from around Europe certainly look to our, our tech sector, the ability to bring those two together um, as we, we, we drive growth post COVID, I think is a tremendously exciting opportunity. So very happy to, to take questions either on the, the topic of uh, creative and tech or indeed the, the tech full stop as it were. Back over to you, Brent. Brilliant. Thank you very much. I see we've got lots of good questions in the chat, so I won't, I won't take up too many of the questions. I'll let, I'll let, I'll let others ask, ask them. But um, my one, you, you've mentioned some really good examples of sort of startups and tech companies working with big organizations. You know, you'll know well from your GDS days how the government is a big purchaser of tech technology and there are I think probably some lessons there of where it worked and didn't. Um, what are you thinking now about the interface between government and startups and is there more we can do to help startups work with these big organizations including government? Yes yeah, so I mean there's, there's two things first of all uh, we work to overcome this immediate uh, liquidity challenge that uh, startups were we're facing so both with the with the, the future fund and also as part of that uh, the the in the EIS investment that of course comes on top of all the the, the wider liquidity schemes that uh, the chancellor has has announced uh, allowing uh, companies to to borrow at uh, highly preferential uh, rates um the the second sort of point is about how we open up government procurement opportunities this is something i was passionate about during my time as a uh, minister for implementation and then um, uh, minister for the cabinet office. If you look at the sort of challenges that government faces, often it's those new uh, innovative companies that can take a fresh look at challenges and help government through it. And the, the need for innovative thinking has, has uh, never been greater, not just in terms of uh, dealing with the, the public health aspects of the coronavirus, and you've, you've seen many examples of how tech has stepped up to the plate on that. But if you take, for example, the, the areas that I'm responsible for, in addition to digital as, as Secretary of State, think about how you can access um, the visitor economy, something I was talking about uh, earlier today. We don't really want the situation where people just turn up at the London Eye or whatever it is and start queuing around the block. If you think of the public health challenges of that, uh, queues snaking round back for a a mile at social distancing, uh, there's clearly got to be a role for, for tech in terms of um, people being able to advance book, to understand where the pressures are. So if you look, for example, some of the challenges around um, lots of people going to, to certain places as we've seen in, in recent days, if there's ways of informing people as to where, where the flashpoints are, we can help manage demand in that way. There's so many different challenges thrown up uh, by the, the COVID crisis and the, the new normal that we see after it. And many of those lead back to, to tech to help us overcome it. You can, can startups see a list of these challenges anywhere, I guess, is also the other part of that question. Uh, yes, it's a, it's a very good point. Um, we had things like the Crown Marketplace uh, that, that traditionally did that. It is a good challenge back to government about how we can get those challenges out to you. And that's certainly something that I, I will take away because I only have responsibility for the, the DCMS sectors, but I'll discuss it with other colleagues as well to have some sort of open forum for, for, for exchange of, of challenges and, and solutions. But partly that's why, for example, um, in relation to the task forces that we're creating, I, I made sure that we have tech representation on the, the task forces to try and think innovatively about that kind of thing. Great. Um, I think we'll go quickly to Lord, Madel, Lord Mandelson, then Peter Bazalgette, and then Kar Karan Bilamoria. Um, Lord Bilamoria. Okay, so can we unmute Lord Mandelson, Chair of the Design Museum? Oliver, I've just come off a long conference call this afternoon, moderated by your former colleague Nicola Blackwood, which was about harnessing data and new technology by the National Health Service. Uh, and we have seen during the course of this crisis quite a revolutionary acceleration uh, of, of this. I mean, the NHS's unique data assets have been used to drive decision-making across the system. There are pockets of 
um, brilliance uh, waiting uh, to be uh, unlocked across the private and public uh, sectors. Here's the point. The Design Museum, whose trustees I chair, wants to create a future observatory to enable the country to peer into the future and to see and understand and encourage and participation in tr the transformation or use of data and new technologies in relation to clean growth, healthcare, aging, mobility, and in other areas of the economy and society. Uh, and we'll be looking for government support for that. We won't be able to do that if the museum doesn't survive. And at the moment, we are under fantastic pressure. So I just want to make this point to you. The government is offering support to museums. Please don't just support the venerable institutions with their large reserves and endowments. Look to the new cutting edge museums as well, because we have a huge amount to contribute to the future of this country, our economy and our society. Uh, so please look beyond the immediate need for the museum sector and use your imagination and creativity. Thank you. It's a, it's a very good question, a very good uh, pitch for the, the, the design museum. Um, in respect to those, I think there's, there's, there's three points that I, I'd made, like to make. First, in relation to data, uh, I think the sort of flexible approach that we've seen to the use of data and the, the way that, um, for example, the Information Commissioner's Office has, uh, and the Information Commissioner herself has shown that flexibility as to how we use data to um, solve challenges across uh, government and the, the public sector is really refreshing. And seeing data not just as a, a threat and a challenge that you have to sort of contain and apply protections to, but also see the opportunities it has in, in public uh, policy making. Uh, I hope that as we go forward, uh, we, we, will con we will continue in that sort of um, spirit of, of positive uh, working together. On the, the point about uh, the, the future uh, observatory and, and indeed support for, for institutions, you're you're absolutely right, and I'm. I've started having initial discussions about, or not initial, as we as we think about how we um, support the the sector going uh, going forward. I'm very keen that um, the the sort of structures we put in place incentivize fresh approaches and innovation, and incentivize output. So that I think there's some there's a temptation with all of this to to think how. How do we just limit the loss? So how do we put in the subsidies to stop loss of, of capacity? I want us to try and look at it from a positive angle as well. Think how, how do we incentivize institutions to start doing new and, and different things and to start doing stuff again, rather than just holding them in a, a pen. So I think that, that's, that's an, an excellent uh, idea there. Uh, on, on the support for institutions more generally, I think the other challenge is Institutions have been brilliant uh, in recent years at taking a more innovative approach the past sort of 20 years or so. Um, you know, greater use of commercial opportunities, uh, whether that's you know, everything from cafes to, to using them for, for conferences, to innovative ways of funding, become less dependent on the state. I'd hate us to be in a position where the institutions that uh, failed were the ones that were least dependent on the state because they, they couldn't just continue to rely on the rollover of, of, of government uh, grants. I'm, I'm very mindful of, of, of that as well. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Sir Peter Bazalgette. Ah, I'm unmuted. Excellent. Good afternoon, Oliver. Um, the last time I asked you a question on one of these strange calls, Oliver, I was asked to say what hat I was wearing. And uh, the hats I'm wearing this afternoon <laughs> Are, um, I wrote the report for Greg Clark that became the sector deal for the creative industries and I'm on the board of UKRI which indeed has been funding the sector deal creative clusters and audience of the future investments via the industrial change strategy fund. I think um, the creative clusters and the audience of the future which in, by the way includes the dinosaur and robots project you were referring to have already had quite a lot of success and the policy and evidence center is charting that. And one of the interesting things is I don't think national government can engage with SMEs very easily and we found a way of connecting now 300 SMEs in the creative sector to research excellence in universities across fashion, games, screen tech and so on. Now what I'm 
pressing DCMS and indeed AHRC at UKRI over is what is the next step? For me, the next step for these um, investments and the sector deal is turbocharging the successful clusters, uh, broadening the geographic base, which is already pretty good, the nine clusters, but um, I think with a buddying system from the existing successful clusters, you could set up some good clusters in less, um, in more deprived areas where there's less of an infrastructure. And thirdly, broadening the subsectors that are covered to things like marketing, publishing, heritage and tourism. And I'm really anxious that we get this together before the CSR, uh, presumably in the autumn. So um, I'm pushing UKRI and you, what's the next step for the sector deal in creative clusters investment? Uh, thank you, and it's a it's a good question. Um, and I think what I think if we sort of look at uh, where we where we are with this um, pandemic, I sort of see in different phases. So we had the, um, the the initial public health response and the the measures that we took to stop uh, the, the loss of supply side capacity, essentially. So um, particularly things like the the job retention scheme and the the liquidity schemes that was just making sure that people kept their jobs and businesses kept going through the initial crisis period the sort of second phase that we're in now is the the opening up phase so how we you know, develop the guidelines and there we're, we're confident that it fits in with the wider public health picture um i think the the third challenge which sort of bleeds into to this phase is then how we ensure that the um in, certainly in my sectors and the, across the economy, how the support is there in place as uh, sectors adjust to this uh, new reality. And I think um, in respect of the, the creative industries, it's a perfect example of how, how, we, how we design the sort of the successor to the um, creative industries industrial uh, strategy component, working with the, the, the treasury. So we, um, we encourage uh, innovation and we encourage uh, companies to seize the opportunities that are, are there. And I know that that's something which I've spoken to the Chancellor about as well. He's very keen that we start looking forward to this, this growth agenda and how we uh, government uh, interventions become much more focused on how we, we drive growth going forward as we come out of this sort of ma maintaining uh, supply side capacity phase, which is wh where we are now or, or where we have been recently. Great. Thank you very much. And, and now for, I think it, we'll see how much time the minister's got, but um, we'll go to Lord Billamoria and then afterwards, if we got time, Rupert Gavin and Nick Oliver. So um, Lord Billamoria, a, a broader question. Uh, you can say what you're representing at the moment. Yeah. Oh, what am I representing? Oliver, thank you so much. Um, I, the hats I'm wearing is as, as an entrepreneur, the founder and chairman of Cobra Beer, as the chancellor of the University of Birmingham, we have the Barber Institute of Fine Arts, one of the finest university museums in the country. But also we have the, our School of Medicine, which is uh, at the cutting edge in the testing research at the moment. And I was talking to two of our scientists yesterday, and we're very close now to possibly having a saliva test, which could be both uh, antigen and antibody in one test. Um, I mean, it'd be, that'd be amazing. It's, a, it's a, possibly a few weeks away. But even with the testing capacity that we have now, you talk about the new normal. You talk about less reliance on this phenomenal help that we've had uh, from government, which has been extraordinary. How do we get the economy firing on all cylinders? Surely one of the ways is that all businesses have access to testing, testing their employees on a regular basis, which gives confidence to people to go back to work, confidence to consumers and customers. And then with a track and trace system that is now being put up side by side, and with the virus abating, we'll be on top of it and we can get the economy firing on all cylinders. And then we don't have to have a new normal of social distancing where many businesses cannot even function with a two meter, some with maybe one meter, but ideally with no social distancing, but yes, hand washing, yes, masks, but the testing is the key. Why can't we, and from a cost effective point of view, it would cost a fraction of the hundreds of billions we're spending of support. Thank you. Well, it's, it's, it's an important challenge. I will, I'm will. i going to resist a little bit straying too much into the area of, um, of the Secretary of State for, for, for health and, uh, and, and, and others in, in answering that. But I, look, I think the, uh, the first thing we have to do is to get this uh, virus under control 
to such an extent that we can start applying effective uh, test track and, and trace. So um, this, this is why we're proceeding with caution in terms of opening up the, the economy. So we get it to a level where we can then apply test track and trace. And I think there's been a lot of uh, focus on the, the app, but that's just one way of facilitating tracking who's been in contact with someone we know has had the virus and testing them and isolating those people. And, and the, the health secretary described some of that uh, yesterday. That, that, that is the, the sort of number one uh, tool that we're focusing on because that in that way we contain the virus. As we start to get it more and more under control in that way, that opens up other, um, other opportunities and I think if, if, if we can get to a point where we have that real confidence in test, track and, and trace, we know that if there's an outbreak, we can rapidly identify who's been in contact, essentially remove them from the wider population. Then we can start showing flexibility in all those other areas. And I'm sure testing will, will form part of it. But I think that's, that's sort of the, 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 the journey that we're, we're, we're on on this. But I, look, you're absolutely right to, to, to raise this. There's certain areas for which I'm responsible, particularly theatres, that just are not going to be able to operate in this this new normal. When I say new normal, I'm, you know, I'm talking about the situation we're in now in, for, uh, in terms of, of having to do things in accordance with social distancing, but you can't have theatres uh, really operating in any meaningful way with two metre to social distancing. So uh, we've both got challenges as to how we support theatres and other institutions in that this period now, um, and then, uh, then how we, we continue to develop uh, our macro government response to, to facilitate more more opening up. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. So if we got time, Minister, for two more quick questions, is that right? Yeah. Maybe we can be quick. Um, Rupert Gavin talking about theatres and cinemas. A perfect segue, perhaps, maybe. Rupert, are you there? Um. You're, you're just on mute still. Can we unmute Rupert, team? Yeah, done. I've pressed on mute. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, you. Yeah. Speaking as uh, chairman of the Historic Royal Palaces, chairman of the Video Effects Business Double Negative, theatre producer, director of Salt, uh, cinema owner, and chairman of the Arts and Media Honours Committee, just to indicate that uh, I have a broad uh, uh, contact with all sectors of culture. And I know, Secretary of State, from your recent articles, that you are fully seized with the importance of the cultural sector for the creative economy, for the tourist economy, for soft power. And I'm also aware from what you've written that you understand big sections uh, of this world will imminently disappear unless we can get over social distancing, unless we can get uh, a solution uh, to uh, a, a virus, uh, which may not be for some period of time. The working groups are looking at a lot, a lot of detail and I'm involved with many of them, and that's important. I would just seek to encourage and hear your thoughts as to your task force uh, and urge them to think big and think strategic because I think that we are going to need to keep these sectors flourishing in the future. A strategic idea, be it a culture bank, something big that will get Treasury's attention uh, as being a way to really solve the problem rather than it being piecemeal, my reference was this problem we had just after the Second World War, and the solution was to form the Arts Council. I'm not saying that that's the answer this time, but it was very interesting last time we tackled uh, the near disappearance of culture from this country. We needed a big idea, and I would encourage you on a big idea, uh, Oliver. Thank you, uh, Rupert. Well, first of all, uh, just on the, the, the working groups, the working groups are doing great great work in terms of, of developing the, the guidance for sectors to, to reopen. And then the task force is sitting across them initially to challenge and understand what we can do to facilitate that, that guidance. Uh, but then there are other work streams in the, the department uh, and without going too much detail on, 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 on this call, I've been discussing this, this this morning about how we we see the opportunity as well as the the sort of threat in this crisis. So the, the threat is clear, uh, and obviously given the, the theatre sector is how they operate in this this environment, uh, and indeed across all cultural institutions, they are going to face enormous challenges. But I I do think I want us to be ambitious about the opportunities that 
that come here because I think particularly with culture and creative industries um, we have a way of inspiring people and building confidence uh, in our nation uh, and indeed in accessing um, just getting out into the world again and which which over time we're going to have to start encouraging uh, people to to do so I'm very excited about the op the sort of you know the 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 opportunity we have to to use the the positive power of the the creative industries and indeed particularly relevant to this call again how we can combine it with with tech because uh tech has enabled creative industries to continue in a way they would not have been able to 30 years ago so uh you know i've been able to watch you know i, I watched one man two governors but the only i've had time to to watch but there's countless other examples of of how we've got culture to people at home while they self-isolate. Well then how do we think about new and innovative ways of bringing culture to people as we um, as we come out of this? And particularly looking for example with young people, how, how do we get a, a fresh generation inspired in uh, culture activity? How can government sort of bring people into this and, and enable them to access culture in, in different ways to ways they may have, have done so before? So I think that there are, because we've had such a large crisis there's, there's opportunities for, for fresh thinking and i'm keen that we do that great thank you wonderful i think we've got time for one more question if we may um from a next generation a young resilient entrepreneur who i think is fresh from getting an innovate uk grant nick oliver tell us about it <laughs> yes thank you brent um thank you oliver um so i'm the founder of 48.ai transparency for ai and, and specifically at the moment COVID surveillance but one of the things that um, the government's backed us to do is help open up museums, hospitality venues, live music, theatre venues, etc. And the way the platform works is basically bringing together public and private sector to create what is effectively the Experian or the Equifax of COVID detection. So it's not just one central solution by the NHS or one health service in one country, but actually a layer that can enable public and private business to benefit from shared information. So I guess my question to you is how do we as a startup that is focusing on this big potential uh, for public and private sector where so many employees are still on furlough, if we wait until everyone is back at work, the opportunity will have passed and people will probably have had to have accepted less than adequate solutions. How could government or DCMS in this case help us to actually get into the right places before everybody is already back to where they need to be? Uh, a very good challenge. So I think the, the first thing in terms of the principal public health challenge is engage with uh, NHS X, which is the um, the sort of the tech wing of, of, of NHS of, of NHS. You know, Matt Hancock used to do this job. He's got a real passion for it. He took across Matthew Gold, who used to be at DCMS to run NHS X. He's got a, a real passion for for this area as well. So that would be the the the, the first port of call. Second, and I'm sure um, officials are on this call, they can, they can share with you how you can engage with uh, DCMS in terms of the challenges we face in terms of opening up our, our sectors and the various task forces and groups that we are, we are doing. And then thirdly, there's the more conventional procurement uh, routes through the cabinet office, uh, which given where, where I am now in terms of dealing with other challenges I haven't caught up with recently, but uh, I know that there are lots of opportunities there in terms of the, the procurement opportunities through cabinet office and again happy to pick up with you on that that would be great fantastic thank you brilliant thank you very much minister for being generous with your time and we appreciate i can see from the questions that you are being asked the pressure on the short term and yet your desire to also make sure we're thinking longer term as well so I, I appreciate that there are many demands on your time and excited to um, follow you on this journey at DCMS and um, thank you so much to all of you also for listening. Thank you Brent.